to our friends in the Americas. Good morning to our friends in Europe. I should say good afternoon to our friends in Europe and good evening to our friends in Asia. Welcome to the Virtual Snow Science Workshop 2020. We're very excited to be hosting this event live from Fernie. And we'll see if this works. We've just been treated to the most amazing early morning scene in Fernie. If I uh, put my screen up, you can see the moon. The moon uh, is just gonna be leaving us and the sun's just in the process of rising. It's absolutely stunning. And for those of you who don't know Fernie, Fernie's a mountain town in southeastern British Columbia in Western Canada. Fernie's endowed with incredible scenic beauty as I hope you can see from the window outside. Um, and it offers a huge range of outdoor activities for all seasons. Mountain biking is phenomenal right now. And some of us have been sneaking out for some rides during the run up to this event. However, it's starting to feel as though the seasons are changing a little bit and it's not gonna to be too long until the snow starts to fall. And of course, Fernie is famous for its amazing powder snow, which makes a great connection to the subject matter of this conference, snow science and avalanche practice. We're running this conference live and we're hoping as many of you as possible will tune in for the presentations, panel discussions and poster sessions at the advertised time. It's definitely the way to get the most out of the VSSW because that way you get a chance to be directly involved. You can ask questions, you can make comments, you can even meet the poster presenters in virtual meeting rooms. We've tried really hard to make this as interactive as possible and give as many opportunities to connect with the presenters as possible. And we really hope that you're gonna make use of those. If for some reason you're not able to watch a presentation at the prescribed time, we will be recording and posting the videos of the sessions to the presentation website. And these are gonna be available under the recorded sessions tab you can expect these to be available the day after the pre presentations are given. And yesterday, Steve Kite, the conference organizer, made a great welcome presentation to the VSSW. He also talked about the status of the in-person ISSW plan for Fernie 2021. So if you missed that talk yesterday, you can check out that video on the recorded sessions tab during a break. I've mentioned we're hosting this event from Fernie but we're curious about where you are from. So I'm gonna ask um, for the poll to go onto the, um, onto the screen and you should see that right now. So if you can just uh, reach forward from your couch or from your desk or wherever you're watching from and answer the question, where are you watching from? That would be fantastic. Um, we'll give uh, a few seconds to answer the question. Um, and um, I should note that with these polls, we're limited to having five options. So if you are from maybe Antarctica, which was mentioned yesterday as a potential place where we uh, could potentially see a viewer or two, then um, rather than throw your hands up in display, please tell us where you're from using the chat window. And we're gonna be coming back to that chat window. In some people's browsers, it's um, called the questions box. Sometimes it's labeled questions, um, ask questions to the organizers. It's not the greatest name, but uh, we're using that as a chat window. So then you can drop in your uh, location there if you need to. So it appears as though we're North America centric um, and uh, Europe, around about a third, over a third of people watching from Europe. Uh, we don't have any from South America um, and only 1% of attendees are from Asia. And I think it's uh, around about three in the morning uh, in New Zealand and um, maybe even earlier than that, around midnight in Australia. So uh, I guess those folks are still in bed. Very sensible. So sponsors um, are a very important part of the VSSW. Um, and on the screen, you should see a list of our sponsors for this event. And CIL are a title sponsor. They make avalanche specific explosive products as well as high-tech remote avalanche control systems. MND is the new name for TAS. They're a world-class um, avalanche uh, ex expert 
um, and offer uh, the tagline, which is one partner, many solutions. Tech is a diversified natural resource company and has a significant community presence in the Elk Valley. Avalanche Canada is the home of public avalanche forecasting in Canada, and their tagline is get the gear, get the training, get the forecast. Our other important sponsors include VEASAN, um, the City of Fernie, and Elkview Lodge, which is where we're broadcasting this event from. In addition to our main sponsors, we have short videos that we're, sorry, uh, in addition to our main sponsors, we also have um, ha support, ongoing support for other sponsors associated with the ISSW. And these um, uh, companies and organizations have um, already stepped up to the plate to support the ISSW, and we're hoping that they will continue to do so as we plan and prepare for the in-person ISSW event in Fernie for 2021. So we will be showing some videos about these sponsors um, and uh, each of the main sponsors has a short video associated with that. And we'll be showing those at the start of each session. Um, and I hope you enjoy those videos. Uh, they're really uh, very excellent, well-made videos. So without the contribution for the, from the presenters, we would not have a virtual snow science workshop. So I'm incredibly thankful to the 18 speakers, the 10 panelists, and numerous authors associated with 46 poster presentations. That is a vast amount of work and your contributions to this event um, are absolutely instrumental to the success of the VSSW. So thank you very much indeed. So now I'd like to introduce our very talented Brent Strand, who's the technical producer for this conference. Brent's been absolutely relentless in cracking the whip, getting practice sessions organized, firefighting a range of issues with the technology, and now he's pressing all the buttons and turning all the knobs to make this live show happen. Um, Brent's gonna talk to you about the flow of the day and give you some important details about GoToWebinar and how to make the most out of it for you. Uh, Brent, over to you. Thank you, James. Welcome everybody to the BSSW. I'm glad you can attend this morning, afternoon, evening. Um, we're going to talk about how the sessions are going to flow in the next couple days. Basically, they're going to be broken up into three different uh, sessions throughout the day. Um, each session is going to start with the oral presentations starting in the morning group. Um, and there will be a half hour break. We're going to move to our panel discussions, which will continue into around noon our time, mountain daylight time. And then we'll have another half hour break and go into the oral session in the afternoon. At the end of today's sessions, we're going to start our poster sessions off near the end of the day around 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. As we go through these sessions, um, at the end of each session, we're going to close that webinar. Um, we'll have a half hour break for us to do some uh, little tidying up in the background here. And then you will have to go back to the website, click on that go to live link to bring you back to the next session. Um, that would happen at the end of each session for the next two sessions. And then your third session, you'll go back in there and hit that go to live link and it'll bring you right back into the meetings again. Now, as far as your controls, uh, you all come in self muted. So we don't have uh, a couple hundred people talking over each other. Um, once that you come in, you will be muted. We are looking for folks if you do have some questions and comments and stuff to happen at the end of the presentations there's a raise hand function there's a little uh button on the bottom of your uh bottom of your control panel and uh, you can see that you'll just hit that raise hand button it'll put you in a list and then we will cue you at the end of the presentations for any questions you may have for the speakers um, when you get queued you will be listed by name i will say your name you will be unmuted. You can uh, please start with your name and where you're from and proceed with your question and have your discussion with the speaker. Once you're done, I will remute you folks and then you can go back to being an attendee. Um, with that being said, uh, I think we're gonna start things up here 
and I'm going to hand it over back to James. Thanks a lot, Brant. Um, so I'm just going to reiterate just a couple of points here before we um, get the main show going. Uh, we're going to try hard to start um, at the top and bottom of the hour for each session, and that just makes it a little easy uh, easier for people who are planning to join in specific events, uh, specific talks. Um, and uh, that might give us a few little challenges with getting the timing exactly right. So there's a possibility you might see um, some extra sponsorship videos or maybe a slide just um, telling you uh, just to be patient a little bit. Um, in between the talks themselves, you don't need to close down the GoToWebinar platform. That's only between the sessions. So if you do see that uh, little welcome screen, just uh, leave it on, go take a little break, um, time to make a coffee or uh, have a stronger drink, whatever, whatever it's uh, right for your time where you're listening from. Um, reiterate about the comment box. Um, we really are trying to encourage people to use that chat function. Um, like I said, the uh, the name of that box on some platforms um, is a little confusing. So if it says questions, um, feel free to drop your comments in there. Um, if you do have a question, sure, drop it in there too. And uh, we may not answer it here. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, maybe um, another uh, participant will know the answer as well and be able to chime in. So, um, you know, we are hopeful that that's going to give an extra dimension uh, and allow um, additional comments to, to be made and uh, uh, given a little extra flavor to that. Um, and then question and answer sessions, we are asking uh, for those to be done orally. And as Brent uh, went through, it's the raise hand function that needs to be, uh, you need to put that up in order to uh, be able to um, get in the queue to ask a question during the question and answer sessions. And again, this is a, a really prime opportunity to drill down into some of the speaker's talks and uh, ask for a little bit more context and um, um, query them about their uh, exact methods and, um, uh, and, and other things that you may want to know. So we're, um, once again, I'm going to focus uh, on the outside view here. This is our view from the Elkview Lodge. It's a stunning, stunning place. Um, we've got uh, three separate speaker podiums set up. We've got a very big room. There's a lot of distance between us all. Um, obviously, uh, it's a little challenging to keep things running in our times where uh, we need to be wearing masks and need to be uh, physically different, distant from everybody else. But um, it's uh, been an absolute privilege to set everything up here and work um, towards bringing this show live to you. And it's coming right around to the top of the hour here, right around to eight o'clock. So we're gonna get the show properly started here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Robin Siggers, who's gonna moderate the first session for us, which is entitled Decision Making and Terrain. And Robin is the Outdoor Operations Manager with Fernie Alpine Resort. And Robin started ski patrolling way back in the 1970s. Robin is a very familiar face to all of those in the snow industry in Fernie, and he knows things. Thanks, and Robin, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Well, I wish you could see how absolutely gorgeous it is here today in Fernie, BC. I just wish you could all be here with us. My session today is uh, Decision Making and Terrain. This session is sponsored by CIL Avalanche Guard, provider of avalanche-specific explosive products and high-tech remote avalanche control systems. As James said, uh, people know me for miles around, or at least a mile, or, you know, quarter mile, like some people know me, because I know things. And I, when I say that it's going to snow 70 centimeters overnight, 
in the next 24 hours. They believe it because it happens. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the weather forecast, but because this is a virtual conference, I, I thought I would have to expand the scope. So the Earth, this is expected to rotate around the sun for the next 24, 365 days. Presumably, it will rotate on its wobbly little axis every 24 hours. And for most of us, the sun will continue to rise. Always a good thing. For you in the south, you'll see the beginning of spring. Summer's on the way. We're all happy for you. Enjoy it while it lasts. However, in the north, we are looking forward to darker, colder conditions. If you live in the Arctic, the sun is about to disappear completely. Sorry about that. We looked into it. Can't be helped. For the rest of us, though, this will bring the absolute joy of winter in the mountains. The bliss of deep powder skiing and avalanches, lots of avalanches, large and small avalanches, avalanches for us to observe, avoid, bomb, blast, and forecast, to dissect, to postulate, analyze, and evaluate. Avalanches for us to avoid and keep us all employed. But for most of us, the weather, at least, will be normal. And that is something to be thankful for. Personally, I'm thankful to moderate this session on decision-making and terrain. This session combines human thought processes with moving about in the terrain. And we have an incredible lineup of ski speakers this morning. But to begin, a word from our title sponsor, CIL Explosives. Here's a short video on the Avalanche Guard. This is a Swiss product built by Inon Shetty, distributed in North America with installations in the Rogers Pass, Stevens Pass, Teton Pass, Loveland Pass, as well as the Alaska Railway. For uh, information on CIL products, visit the website. CILExplosives.com. Okay, 
All right, decision making and terrain. These topics that discuss the human sciences. In my view, these are as equally important as snow sciences. So many incidents in my career have happened when the party was well aware of the snowpack conditions and made a poor terrain decision. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Andrea Mansberg. Andrea comes to us today from Tromsø in Norway. Andrea is a professor at the Arctic University in Norway. She's also the founder, creator, and lead researcher of the White Heat Project, which began in 2017, and apparently has taken on a life of its own as a resource for avalanche education products. Check it out, whiteheatproject.com. She's also involved in the CARE Research Group, Center for Avalanche Research and Education, great acronym. And Andrea will speak to us today about how behavioral economics can shed light on some of the subpar distorted human decisions that we make. I like how people vote, I guess. I, yeah, I know. No, she's not talking about that. She's talking about people in avalanche terrain and their uh, behavioral economics and why we do not always behave as homo economicus. Andrea, take it away. Sorry, Andrea, we're having a slight uh, audio difficulty. How about you? Your mic is not coming through. Is it working now? Yes, it is. Is it working now? Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, my speakers are having a life of its own as well. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very glad to give this presentation. Uh, I pre-recorded my video and it's pretty self-explanatory, so I hope you all enjoy it. Hi, my name is Andrea Mander and I'm a professor in economics. Today I would like to talk about how a behavioral economist looks at decision making in avalanche terrain and why I think that the avalanche community might find this interesting. So many people think that economists do research on GDP and inflation. But the truth is that economic research does not have to be about money at all. The core of economics as a science is decision making regardless if the decision maker is a banker or a backcountry writer. The reason for why economists care so much about decisions is that the aim of the science is to increase the well-being or happiness in society. And in order to do so, we need to understand how people make decisions, and why they make certain decisions, and when those decisions create problems, for either for the individual or for society. And finally, what we can do to solve those problems, or at least reduce them. So, when we go into the backcountry, we need to make a range of decisions. For example, where to go and who to bring. Now, when we make these decisions, we consciously or unconsciously evaluate the pros and cons of our different options. For example, the view, the terrain, the feel of the snow, and the risk of having an accident. Now, when we choose to do something, we do so because we think that that is our best option. It doesn't necessarily have to be our ideal choice because we face constraints. For example, our technical skills, the weather, time, where we live, or for example, our partners. But when we do something, we do so because given those circumstances, we think that doing this will make us as happy as possible. So suppose that I know the consequences of an avalanche accident, and I know that conditions are a bit shaky, and I still find that the pros of riding a bull line await the cons. An economist does not necessarily see this as a problem because different people have different preferences, 
And as long as my decision makes me happy in the long run and doesn't hurt anyone else, economists are happy. Economists become unhappy and very interested when people make decisions that reduce their happiness in the long run or that hurt others. So there are two reasons for why we sometimes make decisions that make us unhappy. The first one is that we change our preferences and therefore regret our decisions. And the second is that we don't always use valuable information that could help us make better decisions. So let's start with the regret. Every autumn, I make a plan that this year I'm going to exercise regularly so that I can do all the backcountry adventures that I want to do during the ski season. My problem is that when I get back from work each night, the sofa, Netflix and a beer seems a whole lot more tempting than doing intervals in the rain. This is especially the case if I'm hungry and tired. To make things worse, I keep thinking that today I'm going to stay in the sofa, but tomorrow I'm going to go out. But when tomorrow comes, the sofa just looks so darn good. And I keep doing this, and then when the ski season comes, I still have my spaghetti thighs, and I end up feeling very unhappy with myself. So the reason why I end up in this situation is that I, just like many others, feel that what I experience right now, both pleasures and pain, are much more important than what I might experience in the future. This is especially the case when I experience strong emotions, like when I'm scared or tired or hungry or perhaps horny. All I can focus on is satisfying those needs right now. I can't think about my future. Economists call this present bias preferences because we overvalue the, the present over the future. Now, present bias isn't something that is necessarily bad because it makes us focus on satisfying our needs right now, like getting laid, getting fed, getting away from danger. But they can create problems if we are unaware that we have them or if we can control ourselves in some situations. So, in the backcountry, we run into trouble if we procrastinate to exercise to get fit or practice with our beacons or other ra rescue. And if we make decisions when we're horny for powder or scared or hangry, we might end up focusing on satisfying those needs instead of what we really should focus on. So another reason that we sometimes do things that we later regret is that humans hate to lose. In fact, we hate it so much that even people who in general really dislike taking risks to win something are often willing to take large chances to avoid losses. The problem is that some situations can make us change our minds about what we see as a loss. So before we start a project, for example, a backcountry trip, we usually see the completion of that project skiing a nice line in nice snow as a potential gain. And we're therefore often fairly risk averse. However, when we put effort, time, and perhaps even money into the project, climbing the mountain, we often change our mind and now see not skiing the line as a loss. And this can make us willing to take chances. Economists call these the sunk cost fallacy. It's a fallacy because we focus on irrelevant information. In this case, having climbed a mountain. Now, the sunk cost fallacy is not a huge problem if our project is good and if we have a high chance of succeeding. But it can be catastrophic if we have realized along the way that the risk of failing is much higher. So in our backcountry example, if we realize as we're climbing the mountain that snow conditions are a whole lot more shaky than we initially thought, now if we see skiing the line as a potential gain, we would probably turn back. But if we see it as a loss, we might push on and end up in big trouble. All right, so the sunk cost fallacy makes us focus on things that we really should ignore. 
let's now talk about when, why we sometimes ignore information that we really should pay attention to. So there, there are at least two reasons for this. The first one is that humans really like to feel good about themselves. We feel good when we feel smart and skilled. And we feel smart and skilled when we are the creators of our own successes and when we can blame our failures on things that are outside of our control. And feel even better when we outperform others. The second reason is that avalanche terrain seldom gives us correct feedback on the quality of our decisions. This gives us ample opportunities to interpret information in a flattering but false way. So when I go out into the backcountry and I ski a steep line and things go well, I am motivated to think that I made a good decision even though I might have just gotten lucky. And on the rare occasions when things go bad and I have a close call or an accident, I'm very likely to start by focusing on all the things that I could not control that led up to the accident. By contrast, when I see uh, that other people ride steep terrain, I'm much more likely to think that they got, just got lucky that nothing bad happened. And when I read avalanche accidents reports, I'm very good at finding all the mistakes that they did. So what this means is that we, in avalanche terrain, we're unlikely to learn from, un, from our own experiences. And we may not learn very much from reading avalanche accidents reports. And it also means that avalanche terrain is a very fertile soil to grow over confidence in our ability to mitigate avalanche risk. All right, so finally, why do we sometimes do things that hurt others? Well, one reason for this comes from evolution. Humans are very social animals. We're much stronger in a social group than we are alone. And our social status within a group affects our um, access to resources and our chances to get laid. As a consequence, our self-esteem is closely connected to uh, how well we do in comparison to others. In fact, one of the reasons that Facebook and Instagram are so successful is that it allows us to signal our social status and compare to others. Now, how much people care about social status differs from person to person. And what we think is uh, signal social status also varies. Some people may think that uh, having a nice car is super important and having a nicer car than your neighbor is even more important. Well, others don't care about cars at all, but they do care about having more powder days or skiing more uh, steep terrain than their peers. The problem here is that if I outperform my friends on something that is socially valued, I make them feel less happy with themselves and I motivate them to try harder. What this means is that I may make them do things that they ideally do not want to do just to feel good enough. Our research showed that many backcountry riders associate riding bold terrain with social status and that they feel that if their friends ride bolder terrain than they do, they feel less happy. And finally, that, that this makes them more willing to ride potentially dangerous terrain. Okay, so I've talked a lot about problems and you might rightfully ask yourself, what's the use? Well, I would like to argue that in order to find solutions and improve decision-making in avalanche terrain, we need to know what the problems are because different problems requires different interventions and different people have different problems. So we need to know who has which problem. So for example, if we think or find that some people have a problem because they change their preferences, we have to make them aware of this and help them build structures that keep them to commit to their plans. This could, for example, mean that we could set up uh, committing uh, beacon practice sessions during the autumn. And if we think that people misinterpret information, we might have to consider how we write the avalanche accident reports. And we might have to train people to ask themselves, how could this have been me when they read those reports? And finally, we could train people to, before they drop into a line, think about how would the report read?
because this would put them in the other's perspective. Finally, if backcountry riders are driven by social status, we could try to affect the social norms by targeting role models, because social norms are dynamic, they change over time. It's perfectly possible to make safety and knowledge cool again. There is actually one example, the backcountry ascender, uh, that has tried to do, do this. Super cool project. All right, to wrap up, behavioral economists studies how people make decisions and when those decisions create problems and what we can do to solve them. My research groups have so far only made a few studies. And in the future, we want to analyze a wider range of hypotheses and more importantly, study which interventions that are effective so that we can improve decision making in avalanche terrain. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Um, yeah, that your work is really appreciated on, on many levels. Thank you so much for being part of the virtual snow science workshop from all of us here on the committee. Um, we have time now for some questions. Do we have some questions? Anybody question, question people? Question coming? Yes, yes. we have one question from the floor from Krista Hildebrandt, please. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to know the source of your studies. That was an amazing presentation, but how did you gather some of that information? Well, so many of the things that I talked about are common knowledge by behavioral economists uh, and psychologists for that matter. Uh, we steal a lot from the psychologists. Um, so um, we've done a few studies. We've studied um, the desire to gain social status among backcountry riders and social factors. Um, we've also started to study the role of strong emotions, um, but those studies are still very preliminary. Uh, and we have done a study on how we perceive uh, the cr control that we self has, have on um, snow stability and what others have. So those are our own studies. And the rest are more just um, the literature and behavioral economics applied to an avalanche uh, context. Was that an answer to your question? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. We have another question from the floor for Curtis Pollock, please. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Um, you know, I, right at the very beginning of your talk, you discussed something very simple, but two kind of major decisions before heading into the backcountry, and that was where to go and who to bring. Um, I think the second point of that is often underutilized. Um, I think people end up just who can I bring? Who's actually available to come? Do you, is there any more study decision-making tools, any more literature on the idea of that decision-making, i.e. who to bring, how that affects our day, uh, that type of procedure and mindset? Not that I know of, um, not that I've seen. Um, there might be some other panelists um, in the session that know more. Um, but what I do know, I think I think you're raising a very important question because um, people have very different risk preferences. Uh, that's something that we've seen in our studies that some people are just really willing to take risk uh, while others are not. So my take is always bring someone who has the same risk tolerance as you do because then nobody gets disappointed and nobody exposes anyone else to danger uh, unintendedly. Um, so I think I think that's so important to go with people that you communicate well with and where you sort of have the same goals. Yeah, thanks. I totally agree. I think that's pretty well understood in the professional realm, maybe not in the recreational side and some sort of tools to purvey that or to relay that information, I think would be quite important. But great job. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We have 
A question from the floor from Stuart Rood, please. Uh, Andrea, thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. Um, I might say I really enjoyed a, a spring sequence at Trumsa, um, enjoying the skiing there. You're very lucky. So there's yeah. a, a saying that I, I kind of liked, and that is that good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. But your suggestion that we're un unlikely to learn from our own experience suggests that that saying is not valid. What do you think? Uh, good question. No, I, I think that's true. I mean, um, we certainly do learn some from our experiences, but I think that we might have to train ourselves to learn more. Not everybody learns from their experiences. It, it all depends on uh, how we analyze it. Um, if we try to protect our self-esteem and our self-image, or if we really try to learn. Uh, and I think that's super important uh, for avalanche training and avalanche education to really train themselves to how do we learn in avalanche terrain? How can we learn from the limited feedback that we do get, uh, both from others' experiences and from our own? Uh, but I do think that we learn, but we might have to train ourselves to actually learn. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, another question from the floor from Stephen Jones, please. Stephen Jones, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Go ahead, Stephen. Sorry, Stephen, we're not hearing you here today, so we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, we have a question from Sean Zimmerman Wall, please. Yeah, good morning, Andrea, or whatever time it might be where you are. Um, my name is Sean. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. My question is, in, in your research, have you examined the idea of tight and loose cultures, meaning what role does culture play? Um, you can think of it traditionally as what country you're from and the norms that you experienced growing up and how that impacts your decision making versus what community culture are you part of, thinking uh, in terms of like what ski town are you from or what professional environment are you from? Yeah, I think that is super interesting. And that really uh, boils down to um, social norms. Um, and those varies both over time and over place. We have not studied that uh, specifically, but I've heard others raising that um, question before. And I think it's a very interesting topic to study. What we have seen is that um, we've done studies in Norway and um, the US and we, it looks like there are definitely uh, differences between different countries. So I think that would be very interesting to study and also to see what change, how people change over time. Uh, I know now that there are there is ongoing work. We're collecting panel data, so we're following people over time in Norway, and that is starting to being built up. I think in Canada um, by Hagley and his group, and also in North America. So that will really sort of allow research to dig into that uh, and look into it. But I think it's a very interesting question, but unfortunately, I don't know too much about it yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, that uh, <clears throat> pretty much brings us to the end of our uh, time limit there, but I'm sure there's lots of other questions, Andrea. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I. I'm going to go back and look it over some more and see if I can figure out with your research how to get me off the couch. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you.